Right, we are talking about apprenticing to Jesus, and apprentices of Jesus are those who spend time with Jesus, who are learning from him, who are becoming like him, uh, and who are doing the things that Jesus did. Uh, the reason why we're using this word apprentice is because it is a great way to translate into English uh, the Greek word mathetes. Uh, the Greek word mathetes also means learner or disciple, uh, but really a mathetes was someone who would attach themselves to a rabbi, they would attach themselves to a teacher, they would spend time with that teacher, they'd learn from that teacher, and, and over time their character would become like that teacher, uh, and they would begin to do the things that that teacher did. Uh, it's far more like our version of apprenticeship. Uh, and so an apprentice is actually a great way to translate that word, and that helps us to capture some of the heart of God's plan and purpose for your life. Uh, God's desire is that as his apprentice, you would spend time with him, that you would learn from him, but that learning wouldn't just be a head knowledge, but it would become a heart transformation, that you would become like Jesus, and then you would begin to move in the world uh, doing the kinds of things that Jesus did. And so that's really the heartbeat behind our sermon series. Uh, it's also the heartbeat behind our Practicing the Way groups. Uh, we don't just want to learn about Jesus. We want to apprentice to Jesus. We want to do the practices that he did uh, so that we can be transformed into his image uh, and so that we can move into the world as his hands and feet, uh, becoming more and more like him, doing the kinds of things that Jesus did. Uh, and so that really is the goal of this fall, is, is this apprenticing in a new way, in a greater way to Jesus. As part of our uh, journey of apprenticeship, uh, we are walking our way through the book of Luke. Uh, and last Sunday, we were in Luke 4, 1 to 13, and we read how Jesus, uh, following his baptism, was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, uh, where he fasted for 40 days and was tested by Satan. Uh, Satan came when Jesus was most vulnerable, uh, and Satan tried to derail Jesus' mission uh, by tempting him in a number of different ways. Uh, he uh, tempted Jesus to prove himself as the Son of God. Uh, he tempted Jesus to provide for himself by turning stones into bread. Uh, he tempted Jesus to protect himself uh, by taking a shortcut to rescuing humanity and avoiding the way of the cross. And Satan tempted Jesus to promote himself uh, by jumping off the temple and forcing God to rescue him. In each of these tests, uh, Jesus listened to the temptation. It's not like he said, I am ignoring you, Satan, blah, blah, blah. He, he listened, but he filtered those tests through the lens of Scripture. He listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and he responded from that place of knowing Scripture and knowing God's heart. Uh, and he responded to Satan by speaking the truth of God's word to resist those tests. In every moment, his response to Satan came directly from God's word, which uh, Jesus had been in the habit of hiding in his heart. Uh, as we looked at Jesus, we recognized, man, Jesus is awesome. Uh, that's part of what we did. We spent time with Jesus in his word. But we also began to apply it to our life and say, okay, what does it mean for us as apprentices of Jesus? How do we uh, take this same path of Jesus? What do we learn from this moment? And we recognize that each of us needs to grow in our own capacity uh, to filter life through God's word. We need to grow in our capacity to listen to the spirit. And there are two significant environments that help us grow uh, in uh, listening to God and listening to the spirit. Uh, first, uh, we grow in these, in these practices, in these habits, uh, by spending time alone with God. We need to develop a habit of spending time in God's word, uh, filtering our life through the pages and listening to the spirit. And we also need to be in a community with others around God's word uh, where they can help us uh, have insight and understanding. They can help shape us and form us in community. And so we began by saying, okay, as apprentices of Jesus, uh, we need to more regularly say, what would Jesus do in this situation? We need to more regularly listen to the Holy Spirit and say, okay, what is his response to this moment? Uh, quite often in your life, this may look like the moment you got your phone out and you're uh, responding to someone in a text message with a bit of snark. Have you ever been there? You should already know the answer. I already bought, you know, there's, lot, there's always a moment in those text messages where the Holy Spirit says, no, you, you don't got to go that, you don't, that extra sentence is too much. What would Jesus do in the texting message? He would say, you want to what? I'm going to take a big deep breath. 
I'm not going to respond in anger. I'm going to choose a different path. Uh, that's just one of those micro moments. Uh, it may be uh, at a work situation. The boss says something with a lot of attitude, and you want to respond back with some attitude. Take that breath. You filter it through the life, through the word of Scripture. You, you listen to the Spirit, and you say, you want to what? I, I don't actually need to, to, to jump in there. Uh, it may be while you're driving. Maybe someone cuts you off. Uh, your temptation is, I want, to, I want to react. I want to interact. I want to be upset. And as you filter that through God's word and as you listen to the Spirit, perhaps the Spirit says, hey, pray for that person because that person's going to get somebody in trouble with the way they're driving. And so rather respond in anger, you respond in prayer, right? Uh, all of us every day have those moments uh, where we should be where we desire to be, where as an apprentice, we could be filtering our life through that lens of God's word, listening to the spirit and saying, okay, I'm going to choose different than what Nathan would actually choose. I'm going to choose to react, to respond, to speak differently uh, than my default mode is wanting to. And so that was really what last week was all about, is, is how can we be more intentional as we spend time with God, uh, as we learn to listen to the Spirit, as we uh, gather together in community, how can we more regularly be a people who just stop and say, God, what does your word say? What does your spirit say? How can I respond and move in this world in a very different way? So that was last week. Uh, this week, we're continuing in Luke 4. Uh, and from verses 14 to 44, uh, Luke tells us about the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And he shares four different stories about the kinds of things that Jesus did. So Jesus, two weeks ago in our story, uh, was baptized in response to uh, what God had sort of put on his heart to do. Uh, then he went into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted uh, by Satan to be tested. Uh, now he comes out of the wilderness and he is uh, beginning his ministry, beginning to do the work that God had set out for him. Uh, as we noted in our own vision work as a community, uh, vision work which we've conveniently captured on the wall over here, uh, Jesus is on mission to redeem and restore all people to the Father's kingdom and to return all things to uh, his original shalom. Uh, so that is what Jesus is doing uh, as he's moving through, uh, through Israel, as he's interacting with people. Uh, he is helping people find hope and healing. That's the kind of work, that's the kind of business that Jesus is up to. And so Luke captures for us a few different stories of the way that Jesus was redeeming and restoring, uh, the ways that Jesus was bringing hope and healing. And so I want to show you some of what that looked like. And that's important because as we seek to grow as apprentices, uh, part of what we're saying is not only do we, uh, not only do we spend time with Jesus and learn from him, uh, not only is our goal to become like him as, we are, uh, as we're transformed from the inside out, uh, but the goal of an apprentice eventually is to do something, right? I mean, if you've trained as a mechanics apprentice, the goal at the end of that apprenticeship or even towards the end of the apprenticeship, uh, at some point you've got to get your hands dirty with a wrench and you've got to fix something you got to build something. you got to do something. Uh, and so part of what happens as apprentices, as we look at these stories, is we say, okay, what did Jesus do? And what might it look like for us to begin to do the kinds of things that Jesus did? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a larger passage. I'm going to read Luke 4, 15 to 44. It's a lot of verses. But as I read, what I want you to do is I want you to imagine that you're in the crowds. Imagine you're watching Jesus. Pay attention to the kinds of things Jesus is doing. Uh, pay attention to how the crowds react. Uh, and when I'm done reading, there will be a quiz. I'll be asking you to kind of echo back. What are some of those things that Jesus did? And so I'm reading Luke 4, verses 15 to 44. Pay attention. What was Jesus doing? All right. Luke 15 begins by saying, he taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read the scripture. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. 
All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. How can it be, they asked. Isn't this Joseph's son? Then he said, you'll undoubtedly quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. Meaning do miracles here in your hometown like you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Certainly there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha, but the only one healed was Naaman, a Syrian. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. Then Jesus went to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and taught there in the synagogue every Sabbath day. There, too, the people were amazed at his teaching, for he spoke with authority. Once when he was in the synagogue, a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit, cried out, shouting, Go away! Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus reprimanded him. Be quiet, come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the demon threw the man to the floor as the crowd watched. Then it came out of him without hurting him further. Amazed, the people exclaimed, What authority and power this man's words possess. Even evil spirits obey him and they flee at his command. The news about Jesus spread through every village in the entire region. After leaving the synagogue that day, Jesus went to Simon's home, where he found Simon's mother-in-law very sick with a high fever. Please heal her, everyone begged. Standing at her bedside, he rebuked the fever and it left her. And she got up at once and prepared a meal for them. As the sun went down that evening, people throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. No matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed everyone. Many were possessed by demons and the demons came out at his command shouting, You are the Son of God. But because they knew he was the Messiah, he rebuked them and refused to let them speak. Early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place. The crowd searched everywhere for him, and when they finally found him, uh, they begged him not to leave them, but he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. So he continued to travel around preaching in synagogues throughout Judea. It's a long passage. There's a lot of stuff going on in that passage, but uh, what kind of things did Jesus do? He taught. A lot of teaching is happening in there. Uh, what else was Jesus doing? He was healing people. That's right. So he's teaching. He's healing. What else is going on? Oh, he's praying? Yeah, he's, he's going off by himself to isolated places to pray. Uh, sometimes we can miss that in and amidst all of the crowd stuff. So he's teaching. He's healing. He's praying. What else is he doing? He's reading scripture. Yeah, he's reading scripture as part of public services. He's, he's teaching on it. What else is he doing? He's casting out demons. That's right. Yeah, he's doing a lot of different kinds of things. Um, I think that's pretty... Well. Oh, there's one other thing that he's doing on my list. It's kind of one of those things that's just part of the story, but we can miss it very easily. Uh, he's surviving attempts to kill him right? I mean, they just said, hey, let's, let's just go. I mean, it's not like they grabbed him to throw him off the cliff, but they kind of crowded him. Uh, I think maybe penguin style, where they just all kind of crowded around him uh, with the intention at some point, someone is just going to push this guy. He's going to fall off the cliff and die. But Jesus, it just says, hey, he just passed right through them. He just said, you want to know what? This isn't happening today. So Jesus did some pretty incredible things. He taught regularly in the synagogues. Now, you may be thinking, okay, what actually is a synagogue? Well, in many ways, it's kind of like a church building. 
Uh, they were places throughout uh, Israel and throughout the Mediterranean world uh, where the Jewish people would gather together every Saturday. That was their Sabbath uh, to read and study about God's word. Uh, and so Jesus was interacting in these faith communities. He was uh, going to those places where he was uh, reading scripture and where he was teaching. Now, it's not just that he was teaching, but he was also teaching with authority. People recognized that he wasn't guessing or giving ideas. Uh, there was incredible weight and wisdom behind the words that he was saying. Uh, as part of that, his words were not always received well. Uh, and occasionally he found people uh, pointing the finger. Uh, this isn't the first time they try to kill him. Uh, this is just the first time that it is recorded for us. Uh, there's other times later on where different people, groups, uh, will be mad at Jesus, will try to trick him or trap him, uh, or in some way uh, get him to uh, be arrested or assaulted. Uh, and so Jesus survives. Uh, one of the big concerns that the Jewish people had was what they called blasphemy. Uh, blasphemy was when someone either spoke against God or claimed to be God. And these were particularly offensive things for the Jewish people. And so when Jesus declared that he was the answer to uh, a prophetic scripture in Isaiah, uh, and then when he said, you know, you're expecting me to do miracles, but I'm not going to, uh, they were quite incensed. Uh, they took great offense. And so that's why uh, they desired to uh, kill him at that moment. So as Jesus traveled, he was teaching, he was speaking, uh, he was speaking with authority and power. Uh, some of that power extended into the spiritual realm, uh, where he was casting out demons and where he was healing sick people, including Simon's mother-in-law. And as we think about this idea of casting out demons, uh, sometimes we focus on the evil part of it, but, but really the other flip side of that is he's setting people free, he's rescuing people uh, who had been oppressed by those same demons. So these are the kind of things that Jesus did. He taught, he healed, he set free those who were oppressed by darkness. He proclaimed the good news about the kingdom of God. Uh, he brought hope and healing. He restored and redeemed. Uh, he listened to the Spirit, and even when ministry was going well in one place, he said, okay, God's actually leading me to a different place. And so, uh, I mean, I have a hard time sometimes when someone says, hey, come and help. Uh, I just say, okay, if they've asked me to help, I probably should. And when at the very end of this passage, when this group says, hey, stay and teach us, he says, actually, I got to leave. I've got another mission over here. Uh, so I appreciate your desire that I stay, but I actually need to go. Um, Jesus was able to listen to the Spirit and say, hey, that's where I need to go today. And so at this point, it's worth stopping for a moment. It's worth reflecting again on the purpose of our message series. And what are we trying to do as we read these stories? We're trying to grow as apprentices of Jesus. Again, an apprentice is someone who spends time with Jesus, who learns from Jesus, who's becoming like Jesus, who's learning to do the things that Jesus did. And so Jesus has called us as his apprentices on mission with him to be his hands and feet in this world and so as we read these stories, as we listen to Jesus teach and heal and deliver, as we hear him help people experience hope and healing, what would you say if I told you that this is the kind of thing that Jesus' apprentices do? This is where this message gets a little bit uncomfortable because we're kind of like, I, I don't even know what to do with that. My, my world looks so differently than Jesus' world. Have you ever thought about what Jesus might actually be wanting you to do as his apprentice, as you move through this world? Have you ever thought about what it actually means to be the hands and feet of Jesus? As we look at the overall story of the Bible, we see that while Jesus was with his apprentices, especially the group of 12 that he gathered around him in Luke 5, we see that he not only spent time with them and taught them, but they began to do the things of Jesus, uh, and there were times where he would send them out in groups, and he would say, hey, you, you've been with me. I've trained you to do the kinds of things I've done. Now I'm going to send you out to go and do them, and there's kind of a tell, show, do learning environment where they come back, and they report, and they say, hey, this is what we have done well. Uh, there's moments when Jesus is working with his disciples where uh, they try something and it doesn't work. So Jesus comes in and corrects and fixes and teaches how they can more accurately do that same thing, just the way an apprentice kind of experiences. 
And eventually, after Jesus went back to heaven, uh, they began to do the same kinds of things that Jesus did. They shared the good news. They helped people experience hope and healing. This was actually fulfilling what Jesus himself said in John 14, 12. He said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. So how does that strike you? Do these works seem like things that you might grow into as an apprentice? As you come to church each week, as you spend time with Jesus, have you ever thought about what he might be inviting you to do with him and for him? See, if apprentices of Jesus do the things Jesus did, that might feel overwhelming to us as we try to imagine ourselves moving in Jesus' world. And if you're feeling overwhelmed, it's because I kind of tricked you. I skipped a verse. I told you the what Jesus did. I gave you some categories of the kinds of things that Jesus did in his ministry. But I didn't tell you how Jesus did the things that he did. In Luke 4.14, Luke tells us how Jesus did these kinds of things. And so in Luke 4.14, Luke writes, Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. And filled with the Holy Spirit's power, Jesus taught regularly in the synagogues. Filled with the Holy Spirit's power, Jesus spoke with authority. Filled with the Holy Spirit's power, Jesus healed sick people, including Simon's mother-in-law. Filled with the Holy Spirit's power, Jesus cast out demons. And in so doing, he rescued people who'd been oppressed by darkness. Friends, Jesus did his ministry through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as apprentices, as we're uh, learning from Jesus, as we're trying to uh, step into this apprenticeship, what we need to realize is that the key to doing the works of Jesus, it's not human ability, it's not confidence, it's not smarts. Uh, The key to doing the things of Jesus, or more accurately, the key to consistently doing what Jesus would do if he were you at your home, work, or school, is the filling and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. If you want to do the things of Jesus, you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit like Jesus. That's really what it comes down to. And it can be kind of intimidating to simply say, do the things Jesus did, because Jesus did have a very specific ministry mode. He was operating in a very specific concept, uh, context. Uh, and so one of the things that I love about the Practicing the Way curriculum uh, that we are going to be stepping into through prayer uh, is they define doing the things of Jesus not so much as doing the exact same kinds of things as Jesus, like uh, going into a synagogue and opening up a scroll. Sometimes we can get locked into the details too much. Uh, they describe it as uh, doing the kinds of things Jesus would do uh, if he were in your home, work, or school context. Uh, when, when I say that, it's a little bit more like those old what would Jesus do bracelets that were all the rage in the late 90s. Uh, rather than simply asking that question, uh, what it means to do the things of Jesus in your home, school, work context is to sort of ask yourself to filter your life through the word of scripture and listen to the Holy Spirit to say, okay, if Jesus were here right now at my workplace, if Jesus were here right now at this hospital bed, if Jesus were here right now in my home, what would Jesus be doing? What would the Spirit be whispering to him to do? And we recognize that it always comes from that place of living filled with the Spirit. Uh, Jesus didn't work hard in his own strength and effort, though he did work hard. Uh, Jesus lived filled with the Spirit. And so if we are going to do the kinds of things that Jesus would do, uh, if he were you at your home, work, or school, uh, the secret is that filling and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The secret is to recognize that uh, part of Jesus' purpose in coming is that he would uh, give us the gift of the Spirit. And so first, as we reflect on this idea, 
as we read the stories of Jesus, when we listen to the miracles and see the acts of power, as we think about this whole idea of Jesus ministering from this place of spirit empowerment, it can be easy for us to read the stories of Jesus and just think, well, well Jesus did all these things because he was God. Right? It can be really easy to read those stories and just say, well, that of course is something that God would do if he were on earth. And while Jesus never ceased to be God during his earthly ministry, Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus set aside elements of his divine power and he took the position of a servant. He came with our weaknesses and limitations. There were some aspects of his divinity, of his divine power that he set aside. And so when he set those aside, that is significant for us to kind of study a little bit and think about because it means that if we believe that Jesus' works and miracles were because of his divinity, then it means that everything we read, everything he does is something that only he could do, and we'll never expect the same kinds of things. We'll never expect to see that same kind of hope and healing, uh, that same kind of authority for our uh, family or friends or community, right? Right? If, if the water only parts because God comes down and parts the water, it means that we'll never expect the waters to part unless God himself steps down and does the work all over again. But if we understand that Jesus did the things he did not because he was God, but because he was operating in spirit-empowered humanity, then that means that if we're living a spirit-filled life, if we are listening to the spirit, then we can and should expect to see the kinds of things happen that he was doing. It means that through the spirit, uh, power and authority and hope and healing is not only possible, but it should be something that becomes more and more normal for the apprentice of Jesus. And so as you read these stories of Jesus, it's really important to say, okay, if Jesus is operating in spirit-empowered humanity then that means as his apprentice, as his very human apprentice, there is an empowerment that I might need to access if I'm to do the kinds of things that Jesus did. It's not enough to study hard, though that is important. Uh, it's not enough to be in the right place at the right time, though that is important. Uh, there is something more that I need. I just can't do it in my strength and power. I need the Spirit to be that empowerment, to be that link to do the things that Jesus did. So that's the first key as we think about this idea. Uh, the second thing that we need to understand, uh, and as we understand that Jesus did the things he did because he was filled with the Spirit, it means that if Jesus need to live a Spirit-filled, empowered life, then I need to also uh, make walking in step with the Spirit and living the Spirit-filled life my priority as well. I mean, it's worth saying, as we consider Jesus' life, uh, John mentions that Jesus was filled to the Spirit without limit, okay? And so there is a quantitative difference between uh, the Nathan Spirit-empowered life and the Jesus Spirit-empowered life. Uh, Jesus lived a relationship with God that was incredibly open. Uh, he was always perfectly in step with the Spirit. Uh, and so the quantity of the Spirit filling that Jesus experienced was greater. But Jesus also said in John that for his apprentices... As they place their faith in him, uh, the life of the Spirit would begin to bubble up within them like flowing streams. And so the Spirit-filled life is his plan for us. The expectation for the apprentice of Jesus is, again, it's not about simply doing, doing more hard things. It's about living in step with the Spirit, living the Spirit-filled life. So how did Jesus live filled with the Spirit? I think one of those keys was at the end of that passage where it talked about Jesus went away to an isolated place. He regularly got alone with God. And it's in those quiet moments, in those secret places, that so often we can pray to be filled and we can get spiritually recharged, uh, where the life of Jesus can flow through us. And so to live the Spirit-filled life, we need to set aside time to be with God, to be filled with the Spirit, to reflect on life, to allow Him to recharge us. To live filled with the Spirit, we also need to walk in obedience. We need to be ready to obey when the Spirit leads us, however the Spirit leads us. Part of walking in step with the Spirit uh, is it's a very careful, very, uh, very significant act of literally following, where you're just you're stepping out 
step by step, moment by moment, in faith and trust. And it can be very easy for us to say, you want to what, Spirit? Like, I feel like you're leading me over there, but that seems really uncomfortable, and so I'm actually going to go over here. And in those moments, we've kind of said, yeah, I'm not ready. I'm not, I'm not there yet. Uh, and in those moments of disobedience where we're just not fully following, uh, that can kind of break some of that fellowship. And we have to come back to those quiet places. We have to restart and recharge a little bit. Uh, we are not going to walk in perfect obedience. Uh, but, that, but this is one of the things where as we consider what it means to walk in step with the Spirit, uh, we need to be ready to obey. We need to be in those quiet moments as we're beginning our day. Say, Jesus, I don't know where you're going to lead but I'm ready to follow you. I want to walk in obedience. When you say to pick up the phone, I'm going to pick up the phone. When you say to open the door, I'm going to open the door. Uh, when you say to give, I'm going to give. Where you lead, I will follow. Obedience is a key to living that spirit-filled life. The third key to living the spirit-filled life is, is simply to ask. In Luke 11, uh, Jesus taught about the importance of prayer. He talked about how uh, we should ask, uh, we should seek, and we should knock. But at the tail end of Luke 11, he says, uh, as he's describing this idea of, of what prayer produces, he says, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so if you want to live the Spirit-filled life, you just need to ask for more of the Holy Spirit. Ask for a new filling. Ask for a fresh filling. And then you keep on asking. And you keep on knocking. And you keep on seeking. And the Father will daily fill anew and afresh those who seek after him. Friends, if you're an apprentice of Jesus, God has things for you to do. Ephesians 2.10 says that God created us anew in Christ Jesus for good works that he planned for us long ago. There are things that he wants to do in you. He wants to make you more like Jesus. He wants to transform you. There are also things that he wants to do through you. He wants you to do the things that Jesus did. And as an apprentice, there is a delicate dance. Because as an apprentice, part of the role of the master is to give you jobs that stretch you. It is to give you something that's just a little bit beyond your reach that requires you to lean on and trust your master. And so uh, if it seems really easy, I, I mean... He's going to tell you to do really easy things too, but, but if it feels like it's stretching you, it's still God. He, he's going to call you to do things that are over your head. He's going to stretch you. He's going to ask you to do more that you might be comfortable with. But in those moments, he's promised he will never leave you or forsake you. He will equip you and he has empowered you. You just need to allow the spirit to fill and guide and direct you. You need to spend time in quiet, allowing the Spirit to uh, speak and strengthen you. You need to walk in obedience, and you need to ask for more. Ask for that fresh filling. Ask for more of the Spirit, and be ready to obey when He calls. Jesus did some incredible things, and He is inviting us to partner with Him, to join Him on mission. He's inviting us to be part of bringing his hope and healing to this world. He wants you to be his hands and his feet. How are you going to do that? You're going to do that by becoming like Jesus, by stepping more and more and more into the Spirit-filled life, uh, recognizing that Jesus did the things that he did uh, through that power of the Spirit, and he invites you to partner with him and to operate in the same way through that power of the Spirit. As we close our time, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to sing a song. The song is called Spirit of the Living God. It's a song of invitation. It's a song that's asking for a, a fresh filling of the Spirit, recognizing our desperate need for the Spirit to live the kind of life that Jesus is calling us to live. And so as we sing, I want to invite you to open your hands, to open your hearts, to ask God for more, to confess any disobedience and doubt, and just invite him to fill you anew and afresh. Uh, as we sing that Spirit of the Living God song, you will recognize that utter dependency that's expressed, that if we want to do the things that Jesus did, we're going to need to do them the way Jesus did, through the Spirit's empowerment. And following the song, I'm going to come uh, back up and we'll participate together in another of the works of Jesus. Uh, we'll celebrate communion together as Jesus commanded us to do. But let me pray and then we'll sing. 
Lord Jesus, I thank you for just your incredible example to us. In Luke, we see authority and power. We see deliverance. We see healing. Uh, we see all these incredible works, and we are in awe. But we also recognize Jesus as your apprentices, that it's not enough to just look on them and say, wow, Jesus does really cool things. Uh, your desire is that we would spend time with you, that we would learn from you, but your desire is also that we would actually be changed and transformed, Jesus, that we would become every day more and more like you, filled with your character. And your desire is that we would do the things that you did, that we would become uh, your hands and feet in this world. And it's going to look differently because we don't live in the same world that you did, Jesus, but uh, you know the plans and purposes that you have for us. You have prepared each one of us for the good works uh, that you created us anew in Christ Jesus for long ago. And we recognize that we can't do it in our strength and power. We can't do it through uh, our smart ideas or through our technology. Uh, Jesus, we can only do it by your spirit. And so, spirit of the living God, we just invite you to move, uh, to fall anew and afresh here in this place. We invite you to speak. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.